What is up, Shark Nation? Uh, welcome to another uh, episode of the Shark Pod uh, with your host, Lou Curry, uh, here in Greystones. Mark is out there in Clinic Geary, uh, our other co host. How are you doing, Mark? Good, good. How are you? Fantastic, fantastic. This is our second one of the weekend. Um, we're, we're, we're pushing through here. We've got a great guest here today, uh, Thomas Arnold um, of YouTube fame, but also uh, we're going to dig into. Uh, where he goes from here. This might be a nice snapshot. This is what we were just talking about before we uh, started the, the podcast today that um, that Thomas is just about to finish his, or get his, uh, his university results tomorrow. So this might be a nice jumping off point because we don't know what the next step is, is going to be completely. Maybe 10 years from now, we might look back to this and say, you know, I was way off or I was on the money or, you know, we're going we're gonna to figure it. We'll have a, a nice little time capsule here. How are you doing, Thomas? I'm doing great, guys. Uh, Shark Nation, what a great name. Holy <laughs> Lord. And when you said curry, I was like, it's Steph Curry, the Irish version of Steph Curry. So it's, 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 we're, we're, there's a lot of similarities there. Um, you know, not, not everything's the same, but the, it's spelt the, the same as uh, uh, the great basketball player, uh, Steph Curry. Um, so like I said, you're very welcome here. Uh, to give some background to the, um, to the audience here, um, I'm sure they, if they're on YouTube and they're like in, in the kind of Irish YouTuber uh, kind of sphere they'll, they'll definitely know your background but uh, you're you put out a lot of uh, content on YouTube and that's kind of how people would know you but you're also uh, running your own kind of business which is what we're really interested in as well um, when did you so when did you get started in uh, on the YouTube um, kind of path or when did you start making movies or videos yeah I first started making YouTube videos when I was 14 because uh, I sort of didn't have a lot of confidence in myself. <laughs> um, I started after I, I was in France with my parents and my dad had this video camera and I was majorly into YouTube because I had an iPod touch and I literally spent probably eight to 10 hours a day watching YouTube videos. I was just so engrossed in the whole thing. So when I was growing up, YouTubers were celebrities to me. Like I didn't really watch as much TV and they were all sort of my heroes. So I, for some reason, wanted to make videos. So I started to do little comedy skits featuring myself and my sister. And I'd edit them on my old, my dad's old laptop. And after about two or three months of doing that, I asked dad, could I make a YouTube video? And he's a classic old traditional Irish dad. He's like, not a chance. Um, but I was playing cricket at the time. And he said, well, if you made educational videos and I vetted them beforehand, then I'd allow you to post them. So I did this very simple thing of I'd pick a topic uh, to do with cricket. I Google search it, make a script, do it to camera, edit it on my dad's laptop and do it every two weeks, roughly. And uh, the channel did really well. Like I only had maybe six or 700 subscribers, but it got 200,000 views in 18 months because th there was nobody making cricket tutorials at the time. Uh, so that was me when I was 14. Fast forward almost 10 years now, I'm 23. I've been, I did YouTube on and off until I was 18, until I went, went into college. And I started vlogging in college and that's what I've been doing consistently ever since. It was vlogging, then it formed, like transformed into trying to make viral videos. And now, I'm trying to figure out what to do next because I can't do college content anymore because I'm finished college. Yeah. So it's a transitionary period for me. So interesting. It really surprised me that when you were saying that you've been doing this for almost 10 years. It seems like, like you're only 23 years getting started. Most, <laughs> most 23 year olds have, I don't know what, the, like when I was 23, I guess I was coming out of college as well. Um, I had, I'd gone down the, the road of, and Mark will tell you this because he saw the whole thing in, in real time. Mark's my brother-in-law, by the way. Um, so, oh, oh I didn't know. Know. yeah, so that's how we know each other. But um, so when I was a bit younger than uh, Mark, I had a, a, I'd spent a lot of my college years trying to uh, sell things on the internet, tried to get e-commerce going, didn't really work out. A lot of that was because it was a little bit dodgy. Always, I was always trying to find an angle, uh, and Mark would be uh, <laughs> disappointed in the outcome, all that type of stuff. Anyway, um, so what well, my point is, when I came out of college, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, as in there was no path i know maybe you're saying that you don't have uh you don't know what to do with your videos but at least is that is, is that what your focus is going to be continue to uh be somewhere in the video space yeah definitely i sort of like my day-to-day -day job is i do essentially like freelance video work for businesses so 
video is is a part of my day to day anyway. But I guess what I'm trying to figure out now is I'm on 15k on YouTube, which is grand. And I guess a more important metric would be that I get maybe two to three thousand views anytime I post a video, even if it's not great clickbait or something. But I'm trying to figure out now how can I get from 15 to 50k, and what's the strategy that gets me there and is it that I hammer down on a niche? Is it that I try and just make incredibly interesting titles and thumbnails? I'm just trying to figure out what that next strategy is and also trying to not alienate the audience that I've already built up, uh, which is for me on my analytics, it's 80% of my audience is male and it's mostly young lads and quite a few of them now they'd be all around ireland but there'd be quite a few in south dublin because that's where i'm from Mm -hmm. and i think with my whole college experience and documenting that process it was just very relatable to people who were going to college and in particular young lads because i'm a young lad so um yeah and think about that there's out of all the colleges in dublin like the i guess the experience would be similar enough you know that would uh, kind of resonate with a lot of different uh, groups there. But, you know, those people are going to be graduating too, and they're going to be going into the, the quote unquote real world. Um, and maybe there's just keep going with that group of people as well without alienating them. Um, one of the, the things that I found the most interesting about your stuff as well is, so I, I watch YouTube quite a lot um, because I, I work, so I work for HubSpot, but I do my own thing in HubSpot. So I don't have a team or anything. So I'm on my own a lot. So I usually have two screens. I'll have some sort of YouTube thing on in the background um, while I'm doing my work. But a lot of the stuff is like travel videos or, uh, you know, uh, cost of living in Bali or all these ones that have hundreds of thousands of uh, views. And I think it's almost like, like what you did uh, to get those, uh, to get the views that you're getting. It's more impressive to me because you're just walking around the canals uh, or you're not, you're not, fucking, you're not in uh, Changu, uh, you know, it's some, uh, I don't know if you followed Lost LeBlanc. Did you, ever see, did you ever see him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's got your one from Peru uh, hanging off him the whole time. We could all do that. Like, do you know what I mean? So yeah, but it, I'm uh, a chapel uh, lizard with uh, a yeah. 400 drone camera from me, Matt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I think there's a lot, a lot of room to go there. Uh, so I know I'm kind of going in here, but I find this really interesting. Mark <laughs> has got a word in uh, Edgeway there. But, uh, <laughs> That's the, standard. Uh, standard, standard stuff here. But what's, so when, you, when you're going to get, when, when was your first paying gig? Uh, so I know maybe we'll, we'll park the YouTube business for a second um, and maybe dig into how you're, you're building a business and what you think about when you're being a freelance uh, uh, videographer. Videographer is probably the wrong word, but like um, video creator. Yeah. I got my first paid gig 20, summer 2015. Myself and my best friend, Sean, were filming a cafe in near where we live or where we grew up. And we just did it because we wanted to make one and after we were finished the whole thing uh, about a week later sean rang me up and he's like you won't believe this but mel has given me 150 euro cash Boom. and i was like i was like what are we going to do with that and he's like well we're obviously going to split it and uh i was i couldn't believe someone paid us for a video i thought i'd rob the bank so uh, then i was thinking oh maybe more people would like this you know more maybe more people need this so we put it up on facebook and it got a lot of views organically um and then from that somebody else asked me to do a video a couple of weeks later and i guess i'm skipping a lot of steps but basically from that i've sort of built a freelance business where uh up until COVID, it had built up to myself and two other guys. So it was more of a production company than just freelance work. Um, and we cover a lot of corporate events. We'd cover promo videos, did a lot of work in UCD because uh, I just made built up a lot of relationships in UCD. And it was basically video content marketed through word of mouth. So I've only ever really focused on trying to do a good job for the people who I work with. And that has organically led to getting more business. Uh, I haven't done a huge amount of outreach per se. Uh, And when I have, and I was slightly off topic, but I found that 
it doesn't lead to the type of clients that I want. I, I've always been of the belief that I'm going to put content out there and whoever comes to me and likes what I do and likes my style, they're going to be, they're going to pay me properly. They're going to respect my work. Uh, and we're actually ultimately going to have a better working relationship. That's what I've always found as opposed to me trusting myself on somebody else and being like, I can do this and it's great. You're, you're, I'm so good. Just hire me. It just it has a weird sense of neediness to it. So um, that's what I've tried to do with my content is put myself out there as best I can and the right people will find me. Absolutely. It's really interesting. Well, it's ba- basically what uh, my company does, like inbound marketing is what their what the kind of tagline is all about. Um, and it does, so I've, I've been in sales for a long time, really, um, five or six years like in tech sales and then before that I noticed on your LinkedIn as well that you sold uh, security systems door to door back <laughs> I back. did yeah I also when I was 18 <laughs> I also did that as well so uh, I've been selling things for a long time and the difference between somebody who is open to uh, you know they're looking for at least looking for someone to to fix something for them it may not be you but at least they're open to that and the uh, you know the the pressure of reaching out to somebody who you know is a good fit for what you do, but they have no interest in, in buying from you right now or kind of any time in the near future and trying to get them from there to actually give you a check is a, it's a, it's a long road and it's not very fun either, Mark. What do you think? Yeah. Well, look, the, the dream for any business is to, for people to come to them and not have to, to, to sell too much. And the only way you're going to do that is by having a big audience, a captive audience. Yeah. And that's one of the hardest things to do. And that's why that's why people have social companies have social media is but but i don't think i'd say 99 percent of companies big and small aren't doing social media correctly um but then again but like social media people are tend not to follow businesses as much and stuff like that so i don't know as an individual thomas you're probably better placed there for people to come to you because it's you there's a story same with me and my art people come it's, it's my story as opposed to an art business or a you know, a, a videography, bi- huge business, uh, or HubSpot, for example, a uh, big tech company. Um, I'm I'm interested to like the bit of an elephant in the, in the room right now is, is college. What 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 is the college degree that you're doing, and how does that correlate to, you know, what what you're doing on the on the video side? Uh, yeah. So I, uh, my backstory to actually going to college is that. When I was in secondary school, I was, well, I still am a big nerd, but I was a massive nerd in secondary school. And academics was my sort of competition of choice. I, I really wanted to excel at that. And I got it in my head in fifth year that I wanted to do science. And that sort of didn't change in my CAO uh, all through sixth year. And I ended up doing genetics in DCU initially. But over the summer of sixth year and going into DCU, I had changed as a person and I sort of realized, oh my God, I actually don't like science at all. (laughs) So I went off and did that sales job for six months doing alarms door to door. And my dad said, you have to go back to college. I was like, okay. So he said, why don't you do business? Because you're making videos and stuff. And I was like, okay, grand. Like there wasn't a a big motivation to go and do it, especially because my best friend, Sean, who I mentioned to, I did my first corporate video with, or just my first paid video. He went off to film school. So we were best friends. We had very similar interests in terms of video and he chose to go down the film production route and I chose to do business. And the only rationale I had behind it was I do like doing several things at once. I've always had a few things on the go to keep me interested. So I thought it would be cool to do video at the side and then learn about business. And the practical element was business was only 12 hours a week or something, whereas science was 26 hours a week. So I could flake my way through business and it wouldn't be too hard. And I had gotten the points anyway. And apparently commerce was like a respected thing. So I was like, let's go do that. So, um, when I got into college in first and second year, I did take the piss academically a bit. I, I didn't do a lot because I didn't need to do a lot to pass. And that's all I cared about. Um, I think I, in terms of third year, I had an internship, luckily got one in Microsoft and that 
was because they didn't care about grades so much because I had a very poor grade point average. And this year I, uh, I stepped it up just because I wanted to. So hopefully I got a 2-1, but I definitely did a lot better academically this year. Um, so as it related to my business, basically in college, because the coursework wasn't too intensive, I, I just did all videos in my spare time. So first year, it was a lot of vlogging, not a lot of paid work. Second year, I was getting more paid work. Um, and di- I ended up doing less YouTube. Third year, I did, got more paid work, did less YouTube. This year, I maintained the same level as I had during my internship, but I had more um, like business work than ever. Um, and I sort of just maintained both of them because for me anyway, and I actually think I could fairly blanket say this for a lot of college courses, like it's actually not that taxing. It's not as, you know, I, I've never been of the belief that you'd solely do one thing. Like for example, during sixth year, I was not always studying. Like I had other interests. And um, I think you can always balance a few things at once. And that's how I treated my business and college during college. Absolutely. There is so much, I don't think I've ever had that much free time that I had in, in college. It was like, like I said, um, like 15 hours a week really isn't a full. And then you can really cram if you need to. Uh, the last four uh, weeks, uh, every semester. <laughs> and I'm like you, I, f- I remember the, I didn't figure this out until my second year in college that only the last year it counted towards my degree uh, in my particular college. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just cruise until then, and then we'll we'll put on the gas uh, last six months or so. Um, so that's what I did. Uh, but probably I could have got more out of it if I didn't do that. But uh, that's that. The so where do you th- where do you think this is going to go? I I'd say a lot of people. This is an interesting time in your life as well because this is actually a time where I talk to a lot of people and even people on the podcast between college and getting starting their career. Uh, it's kind of a very stressful time for a lot of people trying to pick a path, and they may have put themselves on a path four years ago when they started a degree and they like, like with the genetics thing, you're no longer interested in that. Um, so have people been kind of, has there been any pressure for you to become an accountant? Sorry, Mark. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, I've actually, my, my mom's an accountant. Like I don't give a rat to the accountancy. I, I don't care at all. It is, it is slightly interesting anyway, and slightly weird that, most of my college friends are off to become accountants. They're going into EY, they're going into KPMG. And that's something that, you know, when we're chatting with each other, I, I actually, I would know quite a bit about the whole interview process and everything. Cause all that's all they're talking about. Um, but for me now, I'm just sort of continuing with what I did since I was 18. I, like I went into college saying, because I had messed up DC the first time, I remember going into UCD saying, it would be great if I could come out of this sort of degree and have a self-sustaining business by the end of it. And it's, I did both of those things. Now it's sort of, I, I'm in the headspace where I want to continue with the business because I still enjoy it. And my short-term goal at the moment is, can I build up another revenue stream excuse me, build up another revenue stream through social media and try and figure out in terms of with businesses for me, it's one thing being, being able to make video content, but the real El Dorado is to figure out how can they make money through social media? You know, how do you, it's all nice making something pretty, but how can you make something that converts? And that to me now is how can I spend more of my time trying to figure out the platforms in more depth? Cause that ultimately is more valuable for them. Um, but the thing I'm str- I've always struggled with is sort of the hiring process of, you know, Thomas, you can make, get somebody else to edit your videos. Ah, oh, but I really like editing them myself. Well, you do know that that means you can't scale. Ah, uh, no, I don't care about scaling. Then the next day, Oh, Jesus Christ, I wish I could scale my time. So it's it's this weird sort of balance of trying to keep the quality because I care about quality a lot in terms of how the stuff I put out, but also the quality I deliver to clients. And it, uh, even because clients is such a businessy word, just to people. Like I care about the quality I deliver to people. If we're working together, I love to build like rich working relationships. And it's it's difficult for me to figure out 
how to get somebody else on board who can like deliver that quality that I would want to deliver myself. So it's such an interesting thing. And I think a lot of uh, people in the kind of creative business uh, feel that way as well. We had a, a wedding, a very successful wedding photographer on the podcast before. And he said that as well. He, I think he what was a mark like five years before he allowed anyone to help him until it just yeah. got to a point where his whole life was just in the, in the kind of editing room or the, you know. Yeah, I think if you're thinking of the que- like the, the question, should I or should I not outsource? My answer would be you should definitely outsource. Um, or else you, 10 years time, you'll be having the same problems you have now. Like with my art business, one of the reasons that I I couldn't continue on doing it with, and I had to become an accountant and you don't want that. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with accountants. Funny mess yeah. up. Um, <laughs> is because I couldn't scale it. I couldn't scale it. Now I can scale it with the prints, like I was telling you earlier on. I can do an original painting and let let the prints do the work for me. But you don't want to be in the same situation where you're doing everything, being pulled left, right, and center. You want to be the guy going in to the companies, talking to the face of the business. Whereas in the background, you have people who you've taught, you know, your way of doing things. And if you can come up with a, a structure on this is the Thomas Arnold way. Of, of doing videos or whatever it is, I don't know. Um, that's what you should be doing. They could be working in the background and while while you're, you know, getting business in. You've kind of done that. Kicking new ideas. Ideas. You've, you've started to do that with your, like, uh, so Mark has a, a financial recruitment business. That's his kind of his day-to-day. Um, and that's what you've kind of done. You've shied away from the mass outreach stuff that we, we were talking about earlier on and kind of tried to train your people to be basically Mark Baker's uh, on the phone, right? yeah. There's a, there's a, I have a like a template for everything essentially that that people follow. Um, but but at the same time, being themselves, you don't want robots. But I do think outsourcing is is a huge thing in in photography, videography, and I think the more you look into it, the more you'll you'll probably realize that that it is worth doing. And that look, that's just my opinion from an outsider's point of view. And listening to Niall Scully, who we had on, and he was very happy with the with the work that uh, he's been able to outsource and it's just freed up his time. Um, even time for yourself, you know, you don't want to, doesn't want to, you don't want it to become a chore or, or, or to get fed up of it as well. You know, you have to have a life and you can find yourself doing everything. Um, but yeah, that's my opinion. Anyway. So it's kind of a weird, uh, Mark, what do you find with uh, like the people who work for you then, or the, the people who you've delegated tasks to, I guess one thing I've struggled with is like, well, what is their motivation in terms of their life? Cause like I, I, I wouldn't do that. Like I wouldn't take delegated work, but have you found that people just have, they're in different strands of life and some people are very happy to take on, you know, templates and stuff that you've given them. Well, for me, it's a, it's a little bit different because you know, it's, you know, they're, it's almost like their own business within the business, business and as a, obviously a commission structure and and they business develop and we're at quite a a high level like if you speak to ceos cfos and and the guys would be in their 30s that's that's completely different to probably what i'm talking about with yourself you know you could get a va in in india or the philippines to do the work for you not full time they're not an employee they're not the payroll you know that kind of outsourcing um or develop a relationship with somebody in starting college who 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 might be with you for part time for three years and then is good enough then to take on full time, you know when when they when they come out of college and um look, there's different ways of doing it but probably v, virtual assistants VAs would be ideal and then there's companies of VAs so companies that literally have a hundred VAs on their books and they outsource them to you and then you might develop a relationship with them and kind of go away from the company and just have a one to one relationship with someone that's just different ways of doing. That's cool, man. I hadn't thought of that before. Because usually we we talk to people at the like at the end of their career, or at the you know mid career. We're just getting started, so uh, <laughs> it's almost like we can kind of tell you. Because I, I work with a lot of marketing companies who specialize in um, in video as well, so I can see what's working with them and what's uh, what's what the challenges are. And I've got one in particular who do really really good work. They're based out of Belgium, um, but they do. Uh, an incredible high level work for video and all and for the inbound marketing um kind of strategy uh, but all 
not all of their work, but they do all of the the shoots and stuff like that. And then they send all the content to uh, a guy in Poland um, who does a really good job. And they come, it comes back and they just kind of polish it. That's their their thing. So stuff like that. So it, it, you don't lose complete control. But um, one of the interesting things I want to, to kind of pick your brain about as well is where do, where where do you think this can go? How how say five years from now, what what's the what's the perfect future for you? Are you is it a, a running a creative agency? Is it something that you're you've got a hundred thousand uh, YouTube followers and you're kind of focus on monetizing that type of uh business what's the what's the story yeah i find that question very hard to predict exactly because if if we're to flip it and say because i'm 23 now so could 18 year old thomas have predicted where he is now like absolutely not i think vaguely yes like i think vaguely i would have said i would have liked to have had a youtube channel that had a few views on it which has been the case but uh let's let's deal with that i think what would i like right now to be in five years i'd like a house like a property that's for sure um just so i can have that income coming in even if i wanted to move somewhere in terms of business wise i'm trying to figure out what i want like at this moment in time and i felt like this definitely for the past year there's uh, an amazing production company run by a guy who was in my secondary school class called Alex Quinn. They're called Bold. You might have seen some of their stuff. They make amazing stuff, uh, visually amazing. Like they do stuff for Betfair, Sky. They've done so many great things, drinks companies. I don't want to be the most amazing visual person ever. Uh, like what I enjoy at the moment Love is... It the quality of my video is good, but I'm sort of, I work best for you when you need a guy to go in and he's social, he gets on with people. You need stuff quick. You need uh, it visually to look nice, but not to be Hollywood level stuff. And um, I'm also helpful because I know quite a bit about business, not necessarily because of my course, but because I've dealt with so many different businesses in freelance that I probably have a rough idea of how your business works. And I can actually have a, a meaningful conversation with you about how are you acquiring customers? Is there another route we can take this it's sort of more general marketing um, discussions? And I'm trying to figure out how can that be a service and then also, is there a way for me to, because I'm not just a videographer either. I am a content creator myself. So like I do know the platforms quite well. And is there a niche for that? Is there a niche for a business where I'm a, I'm a content creator videographer or I'm a content creator marketeer to help you market a B2C brand? So um, ideally when I'm 28, I'd like that there has more scope to that and there's definitely more scale i need something with more scale because i there's only as you know yourself you know you can only get paid so much per hour and there's only many uh, only certain amount of hours in your day in your week so a scalable thing would be good and then lastly i'd like to have traveled a bit and to have seen more of the world and that's where i think those two things mesh is that if there was some way of me doing the work remotely and still giving quality to clientele then like that would be the ideal world for me mark i just when he said in five years he's gonna be 28 i was like oh, this is great you do whatever you want there's so much time you know what i mean it's like <laughs> but it's gonna be, just play jazz it's gonna be don't worry about it go, ahead, go mark i i just had i just had a thought um here we go yeah <laughs> I think I think a big problem with a lot of businesses and even uh, individuals is that they they want to have video as as content, whether it's on Instagram or or YouTube or Facebook or whatever. But they're afraid to be the face, so they're afraid to sit in front. They're afraid to do what you can do. So, as a service, could you provide? Could you could you either teach you know one member who puts their hand up on staff who says I'm willing to be the face of X company, and um, you teach them how to do you know, talking to camera and then you're obviously making the video, but you're also teaching someone how to, how to be in front of, in front of video, in front of camera. I think that's probably a good service to have. Um, or even, 
if 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 you outsourced kind of presenters like um I'm sure like like we got a voiceover for the start of this of this podcast. I'm sure there's people who actually who will just do the face to camera for a company, you know, an actor essentially. Can you provide that as a service? Right, what do you need? You need video. Yeah, we can do the video. What do you need? We need a voiceover. Yeah, we've got voiceover artists and then you outsource the work to those people who did they're not in your payroll, you know, but they they tend, they're they're under the Thomas Arnold uh service offering and i think a face to a talk an actor who kind of presents a video for a company is a would be a great tool that you can provide yeah that's very interesting because what i found with clients and stuff is it's far easier for them to say like i need a good video and when they see something when they see a good image and something that represents their brand they feel good about it because you know, it represents in their head, their idea of their business, but then it might not convert to sales necessarily. And um, I think you're dead right. Having a face to a business is incredibly, is incredibly profitable, but there's, there's like a lot of facets to it. And I think that's why I haven't delved into it yet is that for example, say with LinkedIn, I think one aspect of LinkedIn is making good content Another aspect of it is having your profile set up in such a way that it's a sales page so that people will actually DM you from that or go to your website from that. that. So you could be putting out good content, but if the funnel to get them to where you want to go isn't good, you're actually not going to convert. So it's a multifaceted sort of marketing conversation uh, rather than make a video, you know, so. 100%. I think that all the time with LinkedIn stuff, like sometimes like I'll, I'll look through the other day just in my feed and I was like, is any of this, is any of this for me? Do you know, it's, it seems like the people who are, mar- are making it, it's, it's f- to make them seem a certain way. None of it, do you know what I mean? It, with, it's like a mindset uh, thing where if you're putting out a video or something, maybe it might be actually helpful to people that are watching and they want to click through and then get into your funnel. Um, but like, I don't know. I, it was just something I thought the other day. I'm like, this is like, it's a lot of people are doing uh, LinkedIn marketing uh, poorly, do you know? Uh, or I'm just not the target, but um, it could yeah. be the case as well. Um, but when you, so Mark, when you're, uh, say if you were a, a young buck like this, 30, 23, right? Um, we're thinking about service business, but it, would you, would you say to Arnold, maybe, or sorry, not Arnold, uh, Thomas, um, would you say to Thomas, uh, would you like just do do the travel for a few years anyway? Uh, do travel content while you're there, make, make some, uh, some incredible videos, see the world, um, or would you say uh, to maybe focus on building the building the kind of the brand or building the business first, and then you know taking the foot off the gas, traveling the world? What would you what would you suggest? Um, I think I, I would do a kind of two pronged attack in general. It would it would be um, building up your personal brand on YouTube, whether it's getting to that fifty thousand, one hundred thousand YouTube followers, same on Instagram. And then the work will kind of come to you and you're a thought leader and, and doing these kind of podcasts and stuff like that. Keep on doing that. And it's very hard to monetize that, as you know, but people are doing it. I would do more kind of research into that, how you can get that to a level where you can actually monetize that directly. And then uh, it will, as a byproduct of that, you'll be seen as a thought leader and people will come to you. So it's a, it's a complete sales channel. I would definitely do that. And if one day that took off as your main method of uh, income, your main income stream, happy days, then you can travel the world for the rest of your life. You can do those videos anywhere in the world. So that should always be, be, be something that you should do. And then number two is the consultancy stuff. Um, I, would, I would probably put more focus on that because it's, it's going to bring in more money and it, it brings in the only probably money that you're getting at the moment is from that. So double down on that. Speak to mentors just become you're, you're obsessed with it already so keep going but, but do find someone who's kind of done it already if you can't get their opinion we can give you our opinions but someone who's actually in the industry um figure out can you do it uh, by traveling around and i do your traveling sooner rather than later um to personally I, I do it tomorrow if you could um all right see you later boys yeah done. <laughs> because it gets it when you get that house you're looking for and and you, you know what all the stuff that comes with that uh, it gets harder and harder to you're you're not as free put it that way um so my question to you is 
can you do what you do remotely? And if you can, then what's stopping you from doing it from Peru or wherever? That's the decent Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> uh, I think YouTube, you can because uh, I guess initially in college, I would have thought, oh, I just need to do my college vlogs and stuff. But I've been doing this mini podcast series with my friend Jake about the two of us trying to figure out YouTube. And we literally have a chat every two weeks just um, talking about what's happened the past two weeks and insights we've gathered, yada, yada. And there are a few people who they have such a strong personal brand and the way they deliver the videos that it, it actually can be done anywhere because they can take the mundane, like they could be talk about this green juice and make it a hilarious video. And that's ultimately where you could do it from anywhere because you're not there's a sort of an important discrepancy there. You're not reliant on going to Costa Rica to get views, but the fact that you're in Costa Rica is fine, but you're able to make the content in Costa Rica or Costa del Kulak. You know, you could do it anywhere. Um, that, uh, but you see, I'm not sort of at that stage yet. Um, and I'm reliant on the freelance income, which requires a bit of physicality to it in Ireland for mm. me to make money. Um, so I could go away for two or three weeks, which would be okay, but I need someone to cover me and I'd have a shed lot of work when I come back. So mm -hmm. that's like, on the one hand, I'm very happy that I have my own thing. The downside of it is that it's incredibly reliant on myself and my time. And there's, you know, yourself, there's portions of weeks or maybe months where you feel really tired and you don't want to do any work. And that's just, I don't know, just being human. And uh, they can be unfortunate days and nights where you have to get the work done. So um, I think to answer your question, I need to build up some form of system. And I definitely have that with LinkedIn because I do it in my freaking dining room. Um, you know, I can make LinkedIn content wherever. And if there was a sales funnel for that, great. And I think one thing I'll potentially try and do in the future is some form of online thing so consultancy or a course or an ebook something that's scalable doesn't require me to, me to be there physically but still delivers a lot of value because because but the one thing i care about i know every business talks about this They're like oh we deliver value to our customers blah 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 but i actually really care about that because for me I, like i'm not part of some big fucking conglomerate i'm I have relationships just like this where individual business owners, they run a freaking chip shop and I want to see their chip shop do well, you know, cause I know <laughs> Garrett is a made up name, but like I know, I know Garrett really well. So as long as I can maintain that deliverable for them, then I'll be happy to, to do those endeavors. But you're dead right, Mark, to be honest. And maybe this will be a good kick up the ass cause uh, I've known for the past year and a half that it's not sustainable to do hourly work. Um, uh, well, not that it's not sustainable, but like I wouldn't want to be 33 having the same conversation because that's just not great, is it? So um, you have to move to scale at some point. And uh, it's, yeah. it's giving control away is, is going to be hard because from speaking to you, from listening to you, sorry, you're, you're obviously have a lot of attention to detail and you care a lot about the quality of the output. Which is which is something I can relate to for sure, um. But but that can be perfectionism can can be ba a bad thing in a way. You know, when it comes to freedom, you're it's very hard to unless you let go of control to some extent. You're just going to be a slave to the perfectionism forever. So mm. there has to be a balance that you find while at the same time being happy with with the quality of the output. If you find the right people, um, you should definitely outsource where you can. And you'll you'll make to be honest you, you'll make more money that way, like, which is always great. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> so you can so pay more tax. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Give it at least you know, especially when you're second up there and it's a uh, fifty-two percent. It's a it's a it's a bad pill to swallow. Well, and it, Thomas, uh, like, ju sorry, Luke. Just one thing. Like, you should be all like, if you can with a business like you're doing, you, know, you should strive for. You know the the life arbitrage uh, that Tim Ferriss talks about. Can you live in in Costa Rica and get paid in euros from from multinationals in Dublin? Can you do that? If if that's if you do want to live away for a few years, that's what you should be thinking about. And is it online consultancy telling them how to do their videos and and teaching their staff via Zoom how to 
to you know record certain things and then you'll take you take it you you match it all together then yeah if they, if they need a zoom or not a zoom like a a drone footage of of their the outside of their business you can outsource that bit and then that person can send you that video and then you finish the product in costa rica you give it to them you get paid you know a thousand euro and you're living on I don't, know. I don't know what are they doing bananas. Bananas. <laughs> oh, bananas yeah you're living on bananas you're living the dream okay now i think that's a a great thing to think about i just i love how there's so much possibility here um but uh but thomas you mentioned that or we were, we were talking about that like a lot of people especially in ireland maybe they're you know a little bit shy to go on uh go on camera you know a lot of people are like that like even with the we started the youtube kind of intros or chopping up their our content trying to make it like a more like series or kind of digestible and i'm doing intros and i'm i'm doing about 50 versions of the intro a lot of cursing at the end a lot of you know uh, self-hatred you know to, <laughs> to a certain certain extent um so if you uh, but there, at the same time there's loads and loads of people out there who are uh who want to get into video they want to start youtubing is there any uh tips you can give them or where you where to start stuff that you like need to have uh at the beginning or anything like that you know like say if i'm 18 i want to get into youtubing what would you what advice would you give yeah it's it's very common question and also i can see how it's very difficult for a lot of people because i think the older you start a bit like you were saying there mark about financially or and time wise you can get more constrained you're also socially more constrained because you've been through a lot more of life you've heard a lot more stuff about what it's like being a youtuber you've heard your friends talk about youtubers maybe in a in a disdainful way and um, you might feel more insecure about yourself so there's a lot of like baggage to get through to even post a video and i think that's something that nobody would really understand unless you've put out content is that there is this sort of self-improvement you have to go through or self-help you have to overcome to even put a piece of content out that's even if it's terrible like it's it's so funny how we judge everybody's content we say like his content's crap her content's great but to even put out a crap piece of content i think is an incredible achievement because you have to sort of uh, bring down your ego a bit and realize you're not perfect and be vulnerable enough to allow people in to what you think and how you see the world. So for someone to start off and maybe this will be a helpful s story because like you can, I think the obvious answer is to just do it, but I could give a slightly more nuanced answer. When I was uh, 11, I started like blogging uh, and it was only to myself. So I used to like, I published it online. I think it was on Twitter, was it on Twitter or something? When I was very young anyway, I was pu publishing this blog. When I was like 13, 14, I was making YouTube videos, but I was also doing stuff on Twitter and I just do like medium posts and just put them up and post them. And basically it's, it was a gradual process of like pushing the boat out, making a, like when I started a vlog, like that was pushing the boat out. Then I did a vlog in public that was pushing the, then I did it in college. Then I did one with my shirt off. Then I did one with other people. Then I did. So it was constantly a, a, just a stepping stone process. So if you feel like you want to make content and I think that's something intrinsic in you, like I've always known that since I was 12 that I wanted to make stuff, then why not start with something low key, like just writing a LinkedIn post and try and make it not salesy and make it something you care about. And then maybe you'll be like, Oh, that was interesting. I might try it with a different format. Now I might try and collab with this person. Now I might do a video, but I won't put my face in front of it. I'll just do my voice. Then I'll try a video like baby steps. Cause video is the, the obvious end of the chain almost, but to produce content, you can start with something that's very low key and build up your confidence. I very much uh, liken it to say training. Like the first day you go to the gym for you to walk in and do one bicep curl is better than what you did before. And I know that might sound laughable, but it's actually not like it's, it's exactly how you start. Like I do CrossFit now and I do seven sessions a week. But when I was starting, I was doing three sessions a week. And for me to just go to the gym was an absolute victory. And I was doing three hours of work a week, whereas now like I probably do 15 hours of training a week and it's 
and that was two years ago. So sequential steps can give you so much into your life, you know? It's really, really good advice, I think, because not only, so like I said, it's intrinsic. Uh, the, people, the people who want to make content, it's kind of like something that they've maybe thought about a lot in the, in the past. But I think as well, it is, it is a great, people need to think as well that it's a great different, differentiator. Um, so just to give you an insight into people, like what, what you're doing now allows you to skip the queue in a lot of ways. There's so many people out there uh, who will go for jobs when they're 30 that if you Google them, nothing comes up or maybe a, a guy who does multi-level marketing uh, in the United States comes up. Uh, if you Google Luke Curry, that's what happens. Uh, and he has a, he has a fantastic life. I often uh, <laughs> send pictures to Mark. It's like my alter ego. Uh, he's got all these cars. and everything. Anyway, um, so my, my point there is that uh, if, you, if you're if doing content like this, uh, it's so easy for whatever job people are hiring for. I think just go to YouTube and see what you're really like or, or what you're what you're capable of also if you're if you get to a point where you're like generating it, an income from any type of content even a small income that is so impressive so many people the only income they've ever generated is from the their contracted work hours that they do it's you are such an out, outlier that you i saw your video that you said you made uh, thirty thousand when you're in college that is an incredible outlier i don't care if i'm a so i, I was on the for the last, I guess, eight months or so, I've been on the um, hiring uh, panels uh, for HubSpot. And if anyone, if anyone has any type of side hustle, I don't care what, I don't care about the references that they have. I'm like, I don't care. Get him in. We'll figure out what to do later. He ma- he knows how to make money. Like that's the most important thing in business. Um, we actually had somebody on the on the the podcast that I had interviewed uh, and gave him a job because of that. Um, shout out Oliver if you're listening. <laughs> but you know, he had it wasn't that his it wasn't his uh, his like work experience, but it was that he had the the ability to think outside the box because a lot of your friends and I'm not and it's sometimes it sounds like we're you know slagging off the kind of accounting field, but we just use that as a as a example an example, yeah, because it's it's something that a lot of people are put under pressure in Ireland to go into and fit into that box, and they will when they're forty. They'll have a nice house. They'll have probably you know the the two gar uh, two cars in the garden, all this all that type of stuff. But it's a it's a, how how can I differentiate myself uh, with any other person that was on that that road? You know, um. So you've already you've already got and you're only twenty three, but you've only got already got that differentiator. So sometimes when people are uh, making content, like I said, even if it's not top top quality when they start, um, it's it is better than nothing. One bicep curl is better than uh, curling a donut into your face. Am I right, Mark? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, well, you just continued on to do bicep curls and, and bench press for the, for the last 10 years, Luke. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's still not as big as the other Luke Curry. I'll send you a picture. Uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he's in great shape. He's over there. He's uh, doing great. His house is huge. Anyway, um, can we, can on we... that topic of quality, like mm-hmm. it's something that I think people forget about is when you think of quality, you think of something looking beautiful, but quality in a content context is authenticity. Someone how, like we've seen the, the viral LinkedIn posts of someone losing their job and posting on LinkedIn that day. And it did extremely well because it just resonated with people because it was very real. Like it wasn't manufactured. It was something that they were actually going through. And the quality of your content, like you could film in a potato cam, but if it's like real raw and human, people will connect with it they don't really care how it looked. So uh, I think that's something to remember as well. Is that like, you don't need a load of, another question people always say is, what camera should I buy or blah, blah, blah. I know the default answer is you can film with your phone. Your phone has 4K. You can still do crap videos on a 4K phone. Don't get me wrong. But it's about, as I was saying, getting through the baggage and communicating that's something real and authentic and that you care about, not something that you think Jenny will like in HubSpot, not posting about you and your robe on LinkedIn because you secretly want a job. Because like, no shit, we know you want a job. Everybody wants a job. Everybody wants money. Like, I already know that. So why don't you talk to me about what you care about? And then we can skip all the cobwebs and actually end up doing something you want to do. Because... Another issue I have with, say, um, 
like job interviews and stuff is that a lot of people young a lot of young people go into them and like they actually don't know what they want but then they make up some bullshit answer that they want to be i won't say accountant again because it feels like we're shitting at all accounts but uh say you know i want to be uh, a stockbroker that's one i want to be a stockbroker but like they actually the real answer is i think i like stock trading and I think this could be a good step, but I think we need to review this in six months because I'm not sure. And then they could wake up eight years later and be yeah. like, holy Lord, I, I didn't know what I was no. doing. So we need to have more honest conversations because ultimately I don't care what Mark does as long as he's happy. You know, it's, you, you don't need to get wrapped up around the titles you have around yourself or like what you own or what you say to your girlfriend, what you're doing. You, like you got to enjoy what you're doing ultimately but the fact is that like people that excel in in their you know when you see people who've done really well or, or who would be outliers like they they have doubled down on, on what they enjoy what they're passionate about it's very it's very difficult to become successful in a in a lane that you're just in just to make money just to be safe you know like it, the real people if you really want to do well you have to be obsessive you have to be passionate so and that avenue that lane has to actually be able to make money like you could be you know i was gonna say playing jazz or something expecting to become a millionaire but maybe maybe you can but you know like obviously in video and social media there is there's so much money to be made um so i think you're right to stay in that on in that lane and not be tempted to move into the the typical kind of business stuff if if you've proven or especially you've proven already a lot of people wait till they've finished uh college to to give it a go um, whereas you've actually done the right thing and used all those spare hours and actually proven that there is a business model there. So now it's just about doubling down on it. To, to, to talk about YouTube, we like to be quite practical in this, uh, in this podcast. Like what would be the actual, if someone was starting, like ourselves, we've started a YouTube channel and we found, we've learned a lot. But what would be the kind of key tips you'd have for someone starting a YouTube channel? Um, I pick a niche if you can. Um, I'd start with that. I download vidIQ, which is a Chrome extension. Uh, I get the pro version, which is $10 a month, but well worth it because with the $10 a month, there's a tool called Keyword Inspector. So if I was, for example, an accounting firm, I'd type in accounting and then you'd see all the top search terms with the phrase matches to go with that. So <clears throat> you can see, actually, so a step before that is I'd go on to YouTube, I'd go onto YouTube on an incognito tab and I would type in accounting and then I'd see what comes up next. So accounting tips, accounting advice, accounting tricks. Then before the accounting, I put all the uh, five W's and how. So why accounting blah, how accounting blah, uh, how to accounting blah when accounting blah and just see all the search terms that come up and then i'd make videos literally about those search terms with keyword inspector you can check the search volume so you can see how many people are actually searching for it um so you'll get a good gist there of oh there's people searching for this i could end up in the recommended feed which is the the right sidebar of youtube if i make a decent video um so i'd list out all those topics uh, make insightful videos on them that are a level above what a Google search would give you. So uh, uh, an obvious example might be, oh geez, I know nothing about accounting. Uh, debits and credits. credits. There you go. Debits, debits and credits. credits. So level one, you make a video yeah. explaining debits and credits. Level two, you add uh, a personalized element to it. You add a bit of anecdotes, stories, you learning debits and credits at the start, blah, blah, blah. Um, a level above that would be to give like industry insights. Maybe you format it in such a way that like you do them all in four minutes. They're like four minute accounting.com or something. Um, so I, I do that. And then the last thing I focus on, excuse me, burping all the time this morning. Uh, I focus that green on green juice. Uh, yeah, it's all about that green juice. Uh, Greenjuice.com forward slash Mark Baker. Um, I'd focus on making a really, really clickable title and thumbnail, a really, really clickable title and thumbnail. And another thing that vidIQ has is that it shows you trending videos in your industry. So you can see like the thumbnails of other people and just mix and match what they've done and copy it. Um, and 
I haven't done this before, but I'm sure you could outsource those thumbnails if you don't have the Photoshop skills because thumbnails can actually take like an hour to make if they're, or even longer if they're really good. So um, yeah, focus on that because thumbnails are so, I can't re- say this enough, Thumb, titles and thumbnails are the, the shop window of your YouTube channel. It's like when people are going on the high street, they're like, oh, I'd want to go in there. I don't know if you know Pit Bros in town, but um, they had a sign up for ages that said, sex, now that we have your attention, come in for some nice meat. <laughs> like that's the window to get people in there. So uh, it's so important for your titles and thumbnails to have that. I think that's great advice because we, we were putting up so since we started, we've been putting up our, our videos on YouTube, but it's it's basically, we've almost just been using it as a video repository. We hadn't done anything with it. It was just our videos edited, but they were all, some of our early podcasts were going on, you know, more than two hours and crazy stuff like that. So, you know, it, it is a big step for somebody to, you know, find our, our just who was on the podcast, you know, very, uh, you know, straightforward th- thumbnail. Uh, and then sit there for two hours and watch random people talk. So we've we've kind of taken that on and we're trying to get it better with their um, thumbnails and just like the when we say really good, it's it's interesting as well. You kind of do do you have to kind of see what's working with other people and try not to invent the wheel? Is it would that would that be advice as well? So or or is there something valuable in, in being really good at making your own th- approach to thumbnails? Um, there's no, like, there's no solid answer to that. A lot of YouTube is just trial and error. One of the most viewed videos on my channel, I think it has 80,000 views now is, uh, it's called inside my 675 year old month house. And I literally thought of the idea in the morning because I saw a real estate video and I was like, Oh, let's just copy the thumbnail and I'll act like I'm on the phone and it like blew up in a week and I, I had no idea that that was going to happen. So a lot of it is trial and error. Um, but I just think it's a mix of both. Like t- just test, you know, test stock standard ones, test more out there ones, see which does better. There's a degree of luck to all of these things. The more at-bats you have, the more likely you are that one of these videos will do very well. And it can have this sort of trickle down effect that uh, say one of your videos gets like, 50k or something you might get a thousand subscribers off that 200 of which will be weekly viewers so these sort of viral attempts is what i call them the viral attempts which can be more experimental and they might not work out at all they have tremendous upside because like they can give you a a loyal viewership over time um so i like that idea as well it's kind of like just building a those kind of viral attempts it's kind of like just building a funnel for for the people who maybe you're you're uh, for want of a better word real content but you're kind of more normal content that you make that will speak to or resonate with so it's kind of how do you get people into that funnel you have to get their attention somehow whether that's uh provocative signs over barbecue joints uh or a uh, th- a thumbnail that's that, that that really speaks to people so we've been uh experimenting with that and we'll continue but mark we are uh, pushing an hour here. This is when we usually jump into the quick fire questions. We could chat all day about uh, with YouTube stuff. But I, ju- I just had idea. one more question about, about YouTube. YouTube. Sorry, Luke. Um, yeah. uh, Thomas, who, who in Ireland would be the biggest kind of YouTubers and what categories do they fall into? And is that the reason why they are as big as they are? Um, yeah, to, the second half of that is very difficult to answer. It's a very difficult question to answer, I think. But the the biggest one by subscribers is Jack Septic Eye, who is a uh, a gamer. He's been around for years. Uh, I haven't researched his channel necessarily because, like, often with these guys, you can go back and see if there was a video that really blew them up. There's a it's that's quite a common story. There's they were trickling away trying different things, and one went viral, and it it really did help their career tremendously. Um, but I guess people who I keep an eye on would be Paddy Galloway. He's been blowing up recently. What's he um, He would do, I don't know. He would sort of break down the success of successful YouTubers. He'd be in a class guy to have a conversation with, with, with regards to YouTube as well. 
Um, so he's successful breaking down the success of <laughs> successfully. Made the Tim Harris <laughs> approach with the. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like been very good at monetizing it like i am not good at monetizing youtube yet i have my own side business to make me money but paddy has monetized his videos like very and how successful. many followers has he how many subscribers has he got i think he has he has 100k now at least but he's done it on more than one youtube channel i think um wow. so Excellent. he's a beast he's an absolute beast um, and then, look, Rob Lipset is a stock standard name from fitness. He's been around for years now. He's definitely turned it into a, a good business. Uh, an up-and-coming fitness YouTuber would be Glenn Gillen, who's been steadily growing over the past three years, probably. Um, anybody else? Am I answering your question, Mark? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But it's, it's yeah, I know, I know some of those names, but I do think it is gaming like it helps like if your niche is too small you're not going to be you mightn't get to 100,000 you might get to 20,000 and they're loyal followers and that's our subscribers and that's fine but it does seem to be the family vlogs you know there's a, there's a family called the Sacone Jolies they they must be in the millions of subscribers at this stage and and my wife watches them um and when you see their houses and stuff it's actually just incredible like like huge yeah. mansions it's like some, it's like the, the the new cribs, like um, <laughs> gaming. Obviously, everybody knows that's the biggest thing on, on on YouTube. And my kids are watching people play Roblox and Minecraft all day. Um, I shouldn't say all day. Um, and what else? Yeah, well, gaming and, and kind of family vloggers and, and beauty and health, fitness. They seem to be the big ones. Um, whereas maybe maybe bit entrepreneurship is quite big as well. I have to say, if if you look, um. One other thing before we go into the questions, how does the monetization of YouTube work? Nobody seems to, to fully explain that. On the monetization of YouTube, exactly how does that work or, or do you know? So to be able to monetize at all, you have to get a certain criteria on your channel. So I think it's something like 10,000 views and a certain amount of minutes watched. So then at that point, you can turn on monetization for your videos. And the main metric to look at is what's called CPM. Um, and that's the amount of, you normally say dollars because YouTube is American, so they say dollars. So the amount of dollars you'd get per thousand monetizable views. So um, for me, that's incredibly low. It's at like 50 cents. And also a lot of my college videos, they had copyrighted music in them. So that means any revenue generated would go towards the artist or the le record label who owns the music. But in general, if you're using non-copyrighted music, um, which I do now, most of the time, sometimes I don't, um, you, it would be anywhere from a dollar to eight or nine dollars per thousand views. Um, it depends on what industry you're in. So if you're making finance videos, the ads that can run on that are higher ticket items normally. They're normally courses and stuff, and they end up being higher CPMs. Um, other And like family channels would be very kid-friendly, so they'd have high CPMs because you can sell toys to kids and stuff. Um, other channels, it would be a lot lower. So you don't really know until you start making videos on it. Um, but if you work at the maths on that, if you're getting, even on a smaller channel, 10 to 20K views a month, um, and it's all it's around five dollars a month then you could be getting like a hundred euro a month without having to do very much so um that's sort of how it works it's very channel dependent the one thing i'd recommend is pay for a royalty free music subscription site like artlist or epidemic sound which is a SaaS model it's only like twelve dollars a month so you can have good music but you won't get copyrighted and um just keep an eye on your CPMs. And also, if you're able to make longer videos, you can insert more ads in it, YouTube will. So if it's compelling and people watch for longer, you'll make more money on that. But I've always veered on the side of, just make a video that you'd wanna watch. Don't focus on trying to hit the 10 minute barrier just because you can whack in another ad there if it's three minutes of fluff extra, you know, so. Well, I, I think people would more likely, are more likely to watch the 10 minute video more than the 20 minute because they know there's going to be more ads in the, the longer videos as well. So that, that, that's something I heard, but uh, no, it's interesting to know. Yeah. 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 Love that. So Mark, let's, let's get cracking here. Mm -hmm. 
Do I win a prize here if I answer Musty's correctly? You, if you get everything right, we'll send you a prize for sure. It may Excellent. look like it may be a T-shirt that looks like this. Oh, let's go, baby! <laughs> uh, I probably should have started at the start. The more you mention MarkBakerArts.com throughout the, the whole podcast, <laughs> the more T-shirts you get. Um, okay, I'm okay. Sure it's behind him and me. <laughs> okay, what apps do you use the most? Uh, how many do you want me to say? Uh, just one or two. Uh, okay, my laptop, Final Cut, Photoshop, and Lightroom, and then on my mobile phone, Waking Up by Sam Harris and Adverse. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's your favorite social media and why? Um, YouTube, because uh, there's so much good content there. Okay. What's the best business idea you've never acted upon? Personal branding SaaS business. Personal branding SaaS business. Okay. Uh, what time do you get up in the morning and what time do you go to sleep? Uh, wake up at 8 and go to bed at 11. Okay. Nice, nice nine hours. I like it. If you could do business anywhere in the world, where would it be? Oh, uh, New York. Okay. Um, how much money is enough money? uh about 75k okay what do you fear um oh uh, I, would, I would say nothing here but that'd be like so somebody so, said that yeah yeah um, <laughs> i guess i have it, a, meant it. i don't have a fear <laughs> of drowning <laughs> but like i'm not a great swimmer i enjoy swimming but i'm not a great swimmer so maybe a semi fear drowning i don't know Okay, you'll, you'll have to get down to Greystones with Luke. He's swimming in that ocean every day. Yeah, getting in there. But uh, I also, I, I think I said that, I think that was my answer as well, Mark. Just, I, 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 I love it. a future where that may be how it all ends because I swim quite a lot. <laughs> so. the, the irony, we're on a, a, a podcast called The Shark Pod. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what, what age do you plan to retire? Uh, I'm not going to retire. Is it who you know or what you know? You kind, of, you kind of broke up there. I didn't get that. Sorry, but both, both. Okay. Um, if you could advise someone to learn one skill, what would it be? Um, confidence. Interesting. Yeah, I don't. This, <laughs> these, the last two are kind of a little bit different because it's not that long ago. But what book would you recommend to the eighteen-year-old you? Oh, um, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Okay, I haven't read that. Have you read that, Luke? Shoe, 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 dog, shoe dog, dog by Phil Knight. No, no, I haven't read it. Uh, it's the, the Nike guy, right? It is yeah. savage. You can't, can't put it down. Can't put it down. It's amazing. Yeah. Read it three times. <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give to the 18 year old you? Uh, forget the YouTube videos, just go after birds. Love it. And on that <laughs> bombshell, uh, no, with the good news that you have one, that you, uh, after, afterwards, uh, Mark will send you the, the different versions that we have, but we'll send that out to you for being a, a guest on the show. But uh, I think this has been super interesting. Thomas, thanks very much for, for joining us today. Um, we're, we're just getting started with the YouTube stuff. Um, but like I said, you're 23. You have so much, you have so much time to do whatever you want. You can take a couple of years off and just go traveling. Um, that's what I did and didn't, I didn't have any income or anything when I was doing it so maybe plan plan for that <laughs> that's what I would say <laughs> but, uh, so you're not stressed out when you're in uh, Ar- Argentina or whatever um, but it's, uh, like we'd, if we can help you in any way uh, going forward if we uh, can connect you with somebody that can help uh, in that industry or whatever in marketing we'll, we'll definitely do that but uh, so thanks very much for coming on and have a, a, a great rest of the weekend All right, thanks Thomas thank you All Right. And we're out. Perfect. Thomas, thanks very much. This will be out probably oh, that, was, that was great, lads. Did you enjoy that? Yeah, it was so fun. Thanks so much. That was a great chat. Um, yeah, that no, was really good. We really enjoyed it as well. It was one of those ones, kind of a, it wasn't so much of a how-to, but there was a lot of little how-to bits in there. So we're going to be uh, maybe making little videos on that. Um, using some oh, of the t- micro t- content. <laughs> We're going to serialize this. We're going to micro content. We're going to get our voice out there. All those, uh, all those cliches is what we're going to do. 
um, but it's going to be good. So uh, thanks very much, and we'll uh, hopefully we'll keep in touch and maybe go for a drink when we're allowed to see people in person. Yeah, definitely virtual drink, virtual bar, virtual, club, <laughs> virtual coffee, whatever. All right, cool. Talk to you soon. Bye. Cheers, Cheers, Thomas. Thomas. Thanks, see you, lads. No worries. Bye.